Um, first of all, that for those of you that don't know me, I'm Jamie Bograd. I'm the Director of Application Services, Recruitment, and Student Affairs here at ACOM. Also from ACOM, we have Aaron Helbling and Jessica James. Um, and our featured speaker today is Dr. K uh, Carrie Mandelak from Pacific University. We are delighted to have her. Um, but before we dive in, we have a few housekeeping notes. Um, the first topic in our new series is called the Admissions and Student Affairs Monthly Forum. That's what you're here all today for. Our goal is to provide monthly speakers on current topics in admissions and student affairs. We've previously focused on professional development resources around when our admissions and student affairs group meet in person in the spring and in the fall. So we hope this model will now also allow us to provide those resources throughout the year. We do expect that these webinars are going to last about one hour, which will include time for questions. To cut down on background noise, all attendees are muted. If you have any concerns throughout the call, um, please feel free to email myself or Jessica and we'll try our best to work you through uh, the technical issues that you might be having. And you are free to submit a question or comment. You can do this um, by using the chat box feature. And as long as we have time, um, we will um, you know, feed those questions to Dr. Mandelak and she'll help answer them as well. Again, this is a reminder that the webinar is being recorded and we'll also upload the recordings to our admissions and student affairs monthly forum webpage, which you can access at acom.org uh, backslash monthly forum. We'll also send a post out to the admissions community. So we are very grateful uh, that Dr. Carrie Mandelak has agreed to speak to our community about holistic review. She is an associate professor and chair of the graduate admissions in the School of Communication Sciences and Disorders at Pacific University. She has served as a, both a member and a chair of the National Communication Science and Disorders Centralized Application Service Committee for the past four years. She recently completed her sabbatical project entitled Systematic Evaluation of Holistic review admissions processes in the School of CSD and is a known expert and speaker on holistic review within the admissions and CSD communities. Uh, Jessica and I had the privilege to uh, listen to her speak at a recent conference and we thought that her information was so valuable uh, and we uh, asked her to speak to you today. So again, please help us welcome, welcome her. I'm going to pass the baton over as well. Okay, thanks, Jamie and Jessica and Erin. And um, I am really honored to have been asked to speak with you all um, today and uh, really excited to share what we've done at Pacific and how we've done it to as a case study example of how holistic review has worked for us. Um, I am going to share my screen to my presentation up here. So, uh, like Jamie said, um, I'm an associate professor at Pacific University. The School of Communication Sciences and Disorders is another way of saying speech pathology and audiology. So we are sister professions, but um, by training, I am a speech language pathologist, um, been in the field a little over 20 years. My, speci my specialty area has always been in cleft lip and palate and craniofacial conditions. And so this work in admissions and holistic review is actually a new line of research for me. And last year at this time, I was on sabbatical um, and did a, a in-depth review of what we've done over the past seven years around holistic review. I took over as chair of admissions. Um, again, I'm not a dean or in administration, just a regular old faculty member, but um, a person who just over the past, I would say 15 years, has had an interest in admissions and um, starting my doc program when I taught some undergrad courses, I was one of only four people and the only doc student teaching. And so I had to write all these letters of rec, which gave me this insight into the process. And I really found joy mentoring students through the process and also mentoring them into the field um, around, you know, um, speech language pathology, you know, I dearly love it. So what this work represents to me is really a deep love for mentoring students and um, working with them through this process, but also um, a deep love for the field. So um, I have served on the SIDCAS committee, which is really where I got quite a bit of um, more 
admissions experience across all of these different health professions. And actually, it's sort of ironic, exactly two years ago, I had Stephanie Wirth, who was a previous employee of ACOM, on our SITCAS <laughs> conference call um, to tell us about how osteopath medicine has really used their um, admission system or service to benefit the profession. So we've already been connected, so I love that this came full circle. So um, today what I would love to, you know, I've sort of told you why me, why this. Um, again, in a couple of, maybe two and a half years ago, um, the person that I was succeeding as chair, who is a, um, just like a master in our field, um, said to me, Carrie, there is science behind this and we need to do this work for our profession and you should do it. And I just said, you know, okay. And so here we are. Here we are. So I'm going to do just a really quick uh, refresher on holistic review, the way that I see it, the way I've come to understand it. Not long, because I understand that this is not a new concept for you all as um, a discipline. Talk about a little bit about our process, um, the data um, analysis over the past five years of data, and then also to talk about what's next. What I'm really interested in, and I think it'll be a question later on, possibly on a survey, is just like, how do we, like, what are the similarities and the differences between um, osteopathic medicine and speech pathology and like how we're looking at this issue? I would just love to really dig deeper into that. And part of that is just because I'm particularly nerdy about this area, but I just think it's really interesting to think about how, how as health professions were, you know, very different, but at the same time, I'm sure there's things that are very similar. So recently, um, and it was actually 2013 that this article was published, but recently um, a very large uh, conversation about this ensued. It's like this article sort of came back up to the surface somewhere on Twitter, and then it got moved to a Facebook conversation and 375 converse, you know, comments later, speech pathologists were talking about you know, how this is where we are. So we are a field that is actually, speech-language pathologists, um, it's actually around 92% white um, and 96% female. So there we are as a field right between mining machine operators and mill rates. Um, and so what does this mean for our field? Why is it this way? And clearly this is an issue. When we're talking about speech-language pathology, when we're talking about working with people who have communication impairments and trying to restore those um, skills, there has to be a connection. There has to be a connection, therapeutic alliance we know is really important. And so representation matters. And um, our field does not serve patients who are 92% white. Our field does not serve 96% um, females. And even just beyond race and gender, there's so many more aspects of diversity that are just not represented in the field of speech pathology. So putting that together with what I began to understand about holistic review, and as I began to talk more to people about it and approach people in our national association, which is ASHA, the American Speech Language Hearing Association, when I looked at our strategic goals for that organization and you know what what was you know what were what were they working on, there was no around diversity, there was no goal around admissions. It was more about recruitment and then more about um, fostering leadership within underrepresented groups in the field. And so I you know, emailed the director of membership and I was like, hey, why are we talking about admissions? And he was like, oh, I don't know. He's an association executive. And so I said, let me send you all these things. And we had a lot of really good conversations about it. But when it comes down to it, often what happens is these are the things that people say is like, why? Is that more work? Is that more time? It's hard to make changes from long-standing beliefs and perceptions of what makes a successful professional in our field. And really, we're graduating lots of fine students. And for me, I just wasn't willing to accept that. And there is a movement. Um, I just finished listening to a podcast that was hashtag SLP so white, um, and it was hosted by um, a Black woman um, in our field who's a, a researcher in the area of dysphagia, 
And one of her colleagues who is white, and she was just saying like, why is it this way? But really there is a movement within the field of speech pathology and within many of the health professions already to really champion this idea of holistic review, use this time to recruit people to our field. This is just a screenshot from a uh, Instagram account I follow, SLPs of Color. And just thinking about like recruiting people into our field, but even if they're recruited, we have to have systems which um, widen the lens for admission and then support students right into the field, just like we do with all students. So this is where we're at um, in CSD. And I should mention at this point, there is not one published research paper in the field of speech language pathology or audiology around evidence for holistic review. That will change this year as I begin to publish and hopefully get accepted my, uh, my sabbatical data. But really opening up this conversation is important and needed. And this is where we're at. Um, one of the books I read last year was this book by Julie Passell, and her book really talked about doctoral admissions in humanities. However, I just thought it, we all could relate to this as faculty and staff who are working on admissions, right? Admissions can be politically difficult, cognitively it takes up a lot of um, space in our brains, and just thinking about the procedures, like how do we do it? How do we find evidence of non-cognitive variables within a paper application? How do we balance GPA and GRE, which is our standardized test metric that is used, um, to find students that, like, how does that predict success? And all of us, I'm in a faculty of um, around nine people, I was gonna say 10, like nine to 10 people, but we're all bringing different ideas to the table, different biases, different beliefs about like, what does a strong, like, what does a high GPA mean? What does a low GRE mean? What does it mean to be gritty? What does it mean to be resilient? These are like our impulses or like what we believe predicts success based on past students. And also the pragmatism is like universities are businesses. We have to, we want to admit students that are gonna finish programs. We also want to admit students that will be successful so that we are also being good stewards of their time and money as well. Because it can be really hard when we have those students who have to go through mediation and such. So I always love this quote, I'd love to start with it because I feel like it really frames this conversation. Um, in CSD, I don't know what exactly what all of the challenges are like in osteopathic medicine, but we certainly have large numbers of qualified applicants. So we're certainly turning people away who would qualify and could possibly you know, be very successful in our field. The conversations around the admissions landscape is that it is highly competitive, highly competitive. So it's very hard to get a spot I always used to tell students, cast your net wide, like apply to schools that are higher ranked and lower ranked, even though those rankings are kind of interesting to interpret anyway. But um, we're often saying like, you have to have the metrics, you have to have, you know, A's in all your major courses, you have to have a GRE score, ex you know, at a certain level. That's really often the first and foremost conversation we have with students. And I feel like that has been somewhat to our detriment because there are students who, um, who are first generation and new to the college experience and don't have anyone to sort of say like, this is how you do it, who are in those early classes where it could take some time to really like get to understand what college means. We think about first generation or students who come from lower SES stat, you know, status, then it's, there's also that too. Or just like students who take some time, like where they thought they were going to be in something and they took all these certain classes, realized that wasn't for them and are switching majors. There's lots of reasons why Metrics should not necessarily be the number one conversation, but that's, it's easy to talk about metrics as a quantitative measure. Um, we don't have a lot of research in our field about what does predict success in graduate students and what predicts success as a future professional. We can believe certain things that people have to be compassionate or have to be empathetic or they have to be resilient or have some, ex you know, certain experiences but we don't have evidence about what exactly that is. So it's really hard to say, this is what your admissions criteria should be because we don't know exactly how that actually translates out into success later. Um, I do believe that for you know, both of our professions, soft skills, counseling, compassion, um, being committed to advocating for patients is certainly something we want, but a lot of those things are really difficult to predict through GPA and GRE. Um, there was a recent study done by the Council of Graduate Schools, and it's a master's admission study, but basically they were saying like, 
what's, they looked at like what's important about successful graduate students, but then also where do you get that information? And so many schools, you know, reported that while they want that non-cognitive information, they're not gonna look at it through GPA and GRE scores. So we have to really think about how do we get that information? Um, and then there's, you know, certainly those students that keep us awake at night where we're like, oh, you know, I, this is, those are actually initials of a student. <laughs> For me that I always think about a student that I interviewed and she was like, you know, I really didn't apply for many years, but not many, uh, several years, because I just didn't have a really strong GPA. And it was 3.5. And she's like, but my GRE, I couldn't take a GRE prep course. I just, you know, she couldn't afford it. Um, she was um, one of three kids um, born, um, well, she, had, she was a single parent, raised by a single parent. Her mother worked three jobs. She actually had had all this really great experience working in customer service and then also volunteering at a rehab center and realized that there were no bilingual SLPs there despite the rehab center being on the border of California and Mexico. So the need was there and she kind of thought that was unusual. But when she went to apply, she just said during her interview, she said, I could only apply to two schools. That's all I could afford. So I had to look for score, schools that looked at me as more than a number. And I thought, you've found it. But this is the idea is we want students to believe that they're not being just considered by numbers. And when the CAPS had talked that I was at, that I'm referencing here is when someone said, oh, they got one B in that early class. And I was like, they'd make a great clinician, but eeks. And I was like, that just can't be fair. That can't be fair and that can't be where we're at in speech pathology to be able to dismiss students because of one B. So I was just sort of angry in that talk, but it was fine. So um, again, when you look at the, you know, our census numbers, like how we're represented in the field, um, overall we have almost 200,000 people in ASHA and um, our male representation is going down um, about 1.1% per year. 8.2% um, of members identify as part of a racial minority group. That's way less than 27.6% of our overall population. 5% identify as um, Latino, and that's, again, much less than the overall U.S. population. So when I began to learn about holistic review, I was like, this makes perfect sense for our profession. So how do we start working through this? So we have newly insured patients from underserved communities seeking health care. We have to be graduating and training, well, training and then graduating students that are gonna become professionals that are culturally responsive, culturally um, humble, and have that ability to address complex healthcare needs in very complex people. So this is an article that I look to very often as a resource um, from, it's a, a summary of a very large, um, foundational study around holistic review and I think it will it lays out really how you strategically um, change your admissions processes what you can do to change your admissions processes to become more holistic um, of course the first uh, the first resource that I um, was pointing to besides from William Settle sex work which I'll talk about in a minute is you know AAMC championing championing this work for a holistic review. So I think what people um, in our field don't quite understand yet is that I'm not telling them exactly how to do admissions. It's flexible, it's individualized, but it's this idea that we're looking at we're trying to look at people in a more balanced way. So considering experiences, attributes, and metrics simultaneously thinking about like how will this person contribute value to our program as a student but also as a professional so thinking about a broad range of factors and if we look at that broad range of factors all these different ideas around metrics i'm not sure about the um standardized score that you all use but we use gre um, in a standard way and um, across many programs and there are programs that are dropping that as a requirement right now we still have it um, thinking about attributes, so what are they bringing to the table as far as characteristics, um, demographic factors, and also their experiences. So within SIDCAS, we ask for research, employment, um, volunteer, and extracurricular um, experiences, and I'll show you how we use that information in a minute. 
a few minutes probably. So one shared goal, certainly a diverse, inclusive student body, thinking about like the many needs of our workforce. Um, in speech pathology, people, it's pretty well split between working in school settings and medical settings and fairly well split between pediatrics and adults. We serve patients across the lifespan. Um, when I was at Duke Hospital working clinically, I actually even saw pregnant women, so women before they had their babies with clefts, and all the way then, um, all the way through end of life care is really the span of the SLP um, career or possibilities. So when we think about that, thinking about all the different things that you know SLPs can contribute, we want to think about like looking at all of these things at once versus just cutting off. Um, despite that being an efficient process to sort and you know sort people by metrics and then just draw a line. What I'm really trying to propose to our field is that we look at this in a different way. So thinking about how can we make this an equitable situation across all candidates and not, for example, leaving two spaces open in our cohort to say, well, we pulled this person way up because I had this one you know, great experience, but all these other things weren't fabulous. It's not about a diamond in the rough, it's about applying something from the start that allows people who maybe don't have the strongest metrics or you know, certain attributes to still rise to the top because their experiences are so relevant to our field or so relevant to what we know predicts success of non-traditional students. So this is that study I referenced earlier, that UU Health Study, um, which was really the first widespread, you know, across many health professions, look at holistic review and saw that diversity of student body increases with programs that use many processes versus less. And I think the thing that really stood out about the study is that measures of student success were largely unchanged or improved. And this is something I'll show with our data um, across a number of years. So both of those are there to, I included some of these links just in case people wanted to reference after the fact. But the other place that I've really looked to for information to begin to develop these thoughts besides like nursing and dental education and AAMC, looking at all of the health professions that have really championed it, was um, this idea of a best fit student um, versus just who are your best students and actually how are we determining who are the best students. So it is a paradigm shift and paradigm shifts can be difficult when people have really long standing beliefs about what makes a good student or how admissions should be done. But what I'm trying to really put forward is this idea that holistic review is a sophisticated but yet pragmatic way to increase diversity, multiple dimensions of diversity. I'm not just talking about race and ethnicity or just talking about first generation, many different um, ways we can think about diversity and thinking about, you know, what do we value in students? What, what would make a good student for our program that then we can put out into the world? And William Sedlicek's work is um, open access freely um, available online to get, but um, it's all summarized here in his book. Um, and he looked at like what predicts success of non-traditional students and it's variables that are, he calls it non-cognitive. In speech pathology, when we say non-cognitive, um, our, our faculty member who specializes in cognitive communication disorders doesn't love that terminology, so we call them non-academic variables. But these ideas, when you look at this list of variables, they're all things that you can imagine would make someone an excellent, you know, doctor, an excellent nurse, an excellent speech pathologist is how have they created their success and how are they going to continue to be successful once they're out into the field. So this is work that I've really looked, um, looked to to provide resources for me to continue to develop having this conversation with people in our discipline. Um, so when we think about it, you know, in CSD, we could think about like, yes, we want successful graduate students who can make it through our program successfully or who can be successful in clinic, in our clinical placements. Or can we think about it successful as a successful clinician contributing to our field that represents the communities that we serve. And so really thinking about holistic review as this idea to have best fit. It's led by our program strategic plan and values, which is required for all of us to have a strategic plan, all of us to have vision mission values laid out by our accrediting agency. And then also considering things that promote diversity on multiple dimensions and equity within an application 
um, process. So what I did for my sabbatical was to start with, this is a lot of words, so I apologize, but I'll just walk through it quickly. Um, my, I had two specific aims. I had one that was more quantitative, one that was more qualitative, and um, as sabbaticals go, I was able to, to work through the quantitative specific aim. So looking at, you know, over seven years, how have our initial pool demographics, how do they compare against ASHA member counts or U.S. Census demographic data? So are there things changing within our applicant pool? Um, and then looking at who was invited for interview versus who was not and what is different about those two groups. Um, in speech pathology across the country, um, we have around 250 programs and very few of them do interviews. And what I understand about osteopathic medicine is that there's interview process is, a, a, you know, 100%, you know, everyone's doing interviews. So I feel like that's an interesting, you know, we're starting to do more interviews and we're starting to have more programs catch on to that idea, but um, there is certainly some resistance around doing interviews. But we wanted to look at, you know, what is the difference with respect to diversity? Um, and then later what I want to do with this data is to say, what if we only made decisions based on GPA and GRE versus the decisions we actually made through our process and look at the differences between those two groups. So that's forthcoming. And then which variables are predicting admit, wait list, denied as we make these decisions. So that's where I started. Um, again, like I said, using many of these foundational resources as where I started. Um, the two Council of Graduate Schools, that first link is their general holistic review document, and the second one is the study that I um, referenced earlier. So where I really wanted to spend most of my time um, is uh, around, you know, SIPCAS and our national situation and the results that we got from Pacific. Um, just to, you know, for possibly interesting information, thinking about how many applications we have within SIDCAS. SIDCAS um, is both the SLP application service and the AUD, which is audiologist application service. Um, we have about 65% of programs participating in SIDCAS, so we're still working on that, but that is the highest we've ever been. And in terms of applications, we're getting, as you can see, the numbers are declining, which is what I understand a national trend among health professions but we're getting somewhere between 250, 200 applications per cycle. This year it was down for us to about 180 some. And actually we were constantly communicating that uh, it's so competitive, but really 71% as of that 2017, 2018 year of applicants are being offered um, acceptance at some program somewhere. Um, we do have, uh, the person who created the slide actually is from Connecticut, hence Wicked Smart, but we do have students that are really, who have high metrics in terms of GPAs and GREs. Um, you can see our quantitative GRE is just below 150, but the verbal is about right at 150 and then the average um, about at four. So, but when we look at the diversity of our applicants, um, within the SITCAS application, um, people self-identify, right? So these are people who self-identify through answering the HRSA questions about being first generation or low ASCS. These questions are not required for applications. And then um, for racial and ethnic minority, it's all, you know, between 15, 25, you know, in that range percent. But what we found, and this is national data, this is not the Pacific data, I'm gonna get to that in a minute, but just so you get like a, idea of how this is happening across SIDCAS. So these are all programs that apply to SIDCAS. Um, this is where we're at with the diversity of our pool. So in the 20-ish range. But when we look at who's receiving acceptances or who is not, who are not receiving acceptances, there's a lower proportion of underrepresented applicants, underrepresented minority applicants receiving an offer relative to the diversity in the pool, which is that dotted line. And this also um, is reflected in students who indicate some aspect of being lower SES. So again, less offers than yes offers. That was strange, an offer of no versus an offer of yes, and also for first generation. So 
a lower proportion receiving that offer relative to the diversity in our pool. Yet, quantitatively, they're, the numbers are not that different. So um, when we look at GPA, the GRE scores, just looking at these numbers up at the top, the numbers are not that drastically different. Statistically, they came out as statistically significant because of the you know, very large N. But when it comes to underrepresented minority groups versus our lower SES, these numbers are not you know, drastically different across the different metrics that really predict acceptance to many of our programs. So that's just a summary of what we're seeing nationally. And then let's look at what we saw at Pacific. So at Pacific, we are a small liberal arts um, university. I think we're unique in that um, our undergrad is around 1,700 students, and it's a very traditional liberal arts undergrad. And then we have an entire 1,700 student health profession college, which is our graduate college. Speech pathology should be in the health professions college, but because we have an undergrad program, we're also we're in the College of Ed, just the way it all sets up. But um, Essentially, you know, the, that health professions program is a large part of what we do here at Pacific. Here we start with an initial file review. Two faculty members review each SIDCAS application. Um, we have chosen to look at the last 60 GPA to level the playing field between our post-baccalaureate students who come back and take the leveling courses to be able to apply to graduate school and the students who are more traditional undergrads. So essentially we're catch, capturing that last two the last two years of their GPA. Um, we also look at their biographic information to get um, evidence of diversity. We're sort of scanning academic history and GRE scores to look for any patterns. Um, and what we're doing, like I mentioned with that diversity part, is it's one of our values. So I'm just gonna take us through the values. What we're basically looking for is evidence of these values within their application. Um, and so we offer um, basically in a rubric, which I'll show you, um, let me catch up to myself here. So within a rubric that, so it's standardized across all faculty members that we're using it, we're looking for these evidence of these five values. So whether it's really um, strong, committed, extensive evidence, um, or just strong, or potential evidence or no evidence. So students can receive, basically what we're saying is that, you know, if this is what we value as a program, this is what we're looking for in students. So evidence of advocacy, community, diversity, collaboration, integration, and critical thinking, or evidence-based practice. We do it based on a rubric, and we're also looking for this information within their personal statement. We actually ask two custom questions and then letters of recommendation. So this is just, um, the point I want to make with this is not to go through each value, but it's just to show that as a faculty, we have sat down and calibrated about what does it mean to have evidence of advocacy? What are all the things that students bring to the table and where do they fit so that we are consistent and equitable across all candidates and we're looking at things in the same way. So we've thought about like, you know, these are some of these are abbreviated, but like significant work experience or um, what does it mean to like work, like work 40 hours a week through college? Is that advocating for yourself, advocating for your own financial situation? So trying to think of like what we see in applications and then think about how we find evidence of that in multiple dimensions. So diversity is one of our values. And if we were to break down sort of the formula of what we look at, we're looking at GPA, GRE, personal statements and letters of rec and then values. So that's really like the four components of how we score these applications and the way that we look at values. So diversity is one value within one section, like one component of our applications. And again, diversity can be any underrepresented um, population within the field of speech pathology. So it can be race, gender, sexual orientation, ethnicity, being first gen or low SES, um, coming from a disability community. Currently we have three students who stutter in our cohort. Um, and recently I have heard, I have not quite gotten the full story, but at some program somewhere in our country, a student who stutters was let go from the program because of their stuttering. So that's something that I think um, is something for our field to really work through. What does that mean? Um, but in our um, 
current cohort, like I said, three people who stutter in the, I actually teach the course in stuttering. So that was always very interesting, but to think about like, what do they bring to the learning environment that I cannot provide? And how do other students learn from their experiences and how that enriches the experience overall? And that's just one aspect of so many things that our students are bringing to the table when it comes to the classroom environment. But again, diversity can be multiple things. Um, it can also encompasses language abilities, because that's certainly important um, in our field too. And then thinking about what does it mean, collaboration and integration, and also critical thinking. So like I said, we've sat down to equalize like how we're looking at this, how we're finding that evidence. And then we use a rubric to quantify that qualitative information so that it can go into a spreadsheet and you know can be calculated as part of a score so again we always recalibrate to the rubrics we've designed our essay questions to be vague ish and um i'm sure that's a word right but basically this idea of lived experiences education background who ha how has that influenced who you are as a person and then also like how would you how do you resonate with our own vision mission values so that speaks more to fit but really like who are you as a person in and how have you used these experiences that you've had to influence like this growth trajectory that you're on so we're not trying to get students to speak specifically like i'm very interested in autism or i really want to work on stuttering but really just like who are they are what are they bringing to the table and how is that going to make them um, or how are they going to use that experiences to become a great speech language pathologist again we i'm just showing these rubrics as examples just that we are not just making judgments we're you know kind of off the top of our head about these things but um being consistent being um calibrated across faculty members so that that it is an equitable process throughout and then of course the same thing for letters of rec so letters of rec um are usually schools require three to five so thinking about superior potential when there's that letter that says this is the best student i've had in 10 years or one of the you know, top five percent versus most students are going to be strong we actually found in the national data that the letters of rec it was like 98 percent of them said that students were good or excellent so letters of rec the rubric part of it you know the likert scale doesn't always make a difference but you really have to get into the meat of the letter and like see what they're saying about students um, and then we make a decision after the file review to make a decision around interviews. So we have an overall comment box, which is really our rationale, helps us remember who these students are later, and we make that interview decision. The score that's generated from our file review is used later during decision making. And then when we do interviews, the questions that we use, um, this is just the rubric for how we look at students the evidence that we're looking for in students but the questions are all based on william sedle sex non-cognitive variables in the back of that book he has um you know each variable laid out and just like possible questions and so we took those ideas and each question is mapped back to finding evidence of certain variables um but this is the rubric um students are interviewed with a faculty member and a community partner and so looking at you know um, rapport and being culturally um, responsive during that rating, um, oral expression, just how they're expressing themselves. And this third one is sort of like diversity of lived experiences or changes in perspective. How do they take feedback? Um, thinking about their goal setting and then also the overall fit. So we do each one of those, we score that separately and there's a rubric out there on the side. Um, and again, this is what I was, you know, referring to earlier is that we have these four different components that are weighted. And so, you know, we're still waiting. Again, we're making that decision for interviews. And then once they come for an interview, we calculate the score and bring the interview score to the table and then their file score and work through the spreadsheet that way. Um, we're looking at last 60 and we have a calculated GRE score. And then 50% is coming from places where you would gather more non-cognitive variable information. So the letters of rec, the personal questions is what we use, and also that evidence of different values. Um, there was some fancy stats to create that formula. 
which we don't need to go into here, but we're just, you know, dealing with issues of limited range. We don't have a zero to 100 GPA sort of scale. It's really small. So just, you know, using some statistics to work through some of those issues with range. Um, when you look, this is a lot of numbers, but I'm going to highlight certain columns. When you look at um, the numbers for these past students, the students um, in 2020 are graduating this year. So that's what that cohort is. But when you look at our last 60, what you can see is that as we've worked to become more holistic, as we've worked to be more um, systematic in how we use holistic review and to be more, um, I guess systematic is the best word, but really have dialed down into like, what does it mean to employ holistic review over the past five years? Our last 60 GPA, you can see the range is fairly wide, but that mean score has actually improved just slightly over those five years. When we look at our GRE scores, they're hovering around that low 150. Our quantitative GRE scores are around 147, which is not really that different from the national data. And then our writing, again, is like 3.75 to 4. So over the years, those scores have remained fairly constant. And when we look at our program completion data, um, the first percentage is our program completion, so somewhere between 100 and 94 percent. And then the praxis, pa praxis pass rate, which is the praxis is like our national boards that they take before they graduate, um, is just about 100 percent every year. So those are our, um, those metrics of like, can students make it through successfully? And this is the data that was directly from my sabbatical looking at the last five years. These years, what this means is the year that they entered the program. So this final category right here, this 2019, are students that are currently in their first year. So over the past five years, you can see our numbers. Um, we did have that peak in numbers in, whoops, in 2017. But numbers have increased over the past five years nationally. So this is national data versus specific data. And that is reflected in the um, just more programs joining SIDCAS because we're still working to continue to recruit um, schools to come to SIDCAS. Again, the top is our national um, racial and ethnicity data. And this, I do want to just as a, as a um, not disclosure, but I just want to acknowledge that this data specifically is specific to race and ethnicity, but I want to acknowledge that that is not what um, diversity is all about. This is just a very first early pass at data. Um, but as you can see, Pacific is following, you know, essentially the applicants in our application pool um, are following national trends. If we look a little closer, um, underrepresented minority groups, these three groups are all increasing in number. And we're following essentially some of the same trends. Um, Oregon is a fairly non-diverse state in general, but um, and I feel like 30% of the state lives in urban areas and the rest is rural. Um, but we're not known to be a diverse place with respect to race and ethnicity. Um, and this was the second three groups of American Indian, Native Hawaiian, and um, students who identify as multiple ethnicities or backgrounds. So this now is strictly Pacific data. So what you can see here um, is the difference in the groups between who we are interviewing and who we have denied before interview over the past five years. So over the past five years, we have increased in when we, who we invite to interview. Um, this is white and these are all other race and ethnicities and these are people who do not report. So this includes people who identify as black or people who identify as multiple or any other group. So over the past five years, with our increase and I would say improvement in using holistic review, like really understanding it and using it, we've increased our percentage of um, underrepresented students that we're interviewing. And the students that we're denying before the interview that never make it to the interview stage, that percentage of um, these, the proportion of students in that are either identify as white or another racial and ethnic minority, um, stays about the same. So from there, um, it's, you know, it stands to follow that we are certainly accepting more students who are also 
um, diverse from a racial and ethnic um, perspective compared to students that were denied after interviews slightly. Um, that percentage is increasing, um, but same for the accepted data. And then in terms of matriculating, who actually shows up and sits into seats on the first day, um, what we have seen in this current cohort is that um, we, um, our cohort has switched to a minority majority. So currently the students that are in our first year cohort um, are 40% white and um, identify 57.2 of them identify as all other racial and ethnic minorities. So last year um, it was approaching that and this year we've crossed it. So this is, you know, just showing how our processes have changed. If it's changed because we've created better interview questions that reflect evidence around non-cognitive variables, if we triangulate our data better from the interview data, the file review data, um, and having those discussions. And also I do reflect it, I do believe it reflects just a change in our perspective of who we are offering admission, how we talk about students and what they can offer to our field. And I think that some of those differences are also being reflected in these numbers. So I think, you know, over the past five years, as these conversations have increased, as our processes have become more standard, and we just all understand what it means to have evidence of certain values or thinking about like who are best fit students, I think that also is likely reflected in this data. Um, last year in particular, we did have um, a larger proportion than we've ever had of students who identify as Latino as well. Um, but again, race and ethnicity is not the only aspect of diversity. This is just very early data that I'm showing to you. So for our field, what is next? Um, there was a project just funded, um, a foundation grant to um, universities in Southern California to look at holistic review for graduate programs in the humanities, humanistic social sciences. Julie Pasella is one of the, who is that person that wrote that book that I referenced in the beginning of the presentation. She is um, one of the uh, principal investigators of this project. So I believe that this concept is getting more um, attention and I think people are really ready to talk about it, um, hopefully particularly in our field. But as we continue on, like how do we define diversity? There are many more aspects of diversity to investigate certainly. In our current cohort, um, that first year cohort, 10 out of 35 are first generation college students and 16 out of 35 self-reported some aspect or self-identified as you know having some aspect of a low SES so some environmental variable that reflects a lower socioeconomic status in addition five of the students in our first in this first year cohort also fell below our 3.25 last 60 GPA um, boundary it's not a requirement but when students fall below that 3.25, they sort of get a, an initial first look to see um, if they should have a full review or if that you know, first review is enough. And so five of those students are also in our cohort and everyone academically is doing fine. And we have a cohort of 35 students. Also thinking like, and I'm sure in different health professions, different non-academic attributes are gonna be predictive of success. I think it could vary by institution, it could vary by discipline, but also by having that information and that evidence, it could really inform what we're looking for within SIDCAS, within any individual school's admissions process. I think that the impact of holistic admissions um, cannot be understated really for the learning environment. As a person who is um, deeply in love with teaching in class, being in the classroom, um, and teaching a class and stuttering, I can say with certainty that having people in that class who actually have experienced stuttering over the lifespan um, and who can speak to both like the overt symptoms of stuttering, but also like what's happening underneath the surface, absolutely benefited all of the other students. Um, one of the students who stutters um, is from Nigeria and so has a fairly strong um, dialectical um, accent. And he related really vulnerably. I don't ask students to you know, be this vulnerable, but he was, and he just related the story about being pulled over 
and um, the police officer believing that he was so drunk because he stuttered and he was just angry and the angry he got, the more he stuttered. And it ended up becoming a court case. And luckily he had the means to be able to, you know, hire a lawyer and have like a really competent lawyer represent him. But, and they had the police video of him stuttering, but I mean, it was, it was just a night in jail. It was, you know, all these things. And this is like the experience. This is his lived experiences. This is how he experiences the world as a person who stutters. This is how he experiences the world as a black man. And so to, for other students in that classroom to be able to um, just really, uh, you know, have a deep gratefulness to understanding how his story is different, but what they can learn from that to me, I just like, whew, that was just a lot in a really good way. Um, that being said, that's just one story of uh, many, but I feel like these stories and this information that we can do, we can really need to share how that benefits other students. Um, also the impact, of course, of admissions um, on the long-term workforce. So we have to be recruiting, you know, diverse students, admitting them using a wider lens, and then also like how do we move them into the workforce and supporting students throughout that. So it's thinking about like, how do we evaluate our own outcomes? So for us as a field, um, like I said, I would love to hear more from anybody um, in on this webinar now just about how it's similar, how it's different in your discipline and how this looks, holistic review. But I think that, you know, for speech language pathology and audiology, we have this opportunity to facilitate change. We are starting from ground zero. Again, there's no evidence yet, but like, what can we do to facilitate this change in our workforce that is going to more closely reflect the world that we live and the populations we serve. Um, there's evidence for holistic review. There's also evidence around like what makes what makes a successful clinician, and can we combine that evidence and and really like make some changes in our workforce that are really needed and really important. I think it's going to start with just establishing this core conceptual framework of what holistic review is, what it's not, and thinking about admissions from a person first perspective. I think about the legacy of our programs when we put students out into the community and their clinical placements. We want students who are certainly academically successful, but also who are culturally sensitive, culturally responsive, culturally humble, and can provide really competent clinical care. In the field of speech language pathology and audiology, in those fields, we still have a lot of work to do. So thank you so much for your attention. I know I talk really fast and um, nonstop for 50 minutes. Um, so I appreciate um, y'all listening. I would love to hear, um, you know, what you think about this information wise and would always love to discuss, share resources um, as we move forward. So thank you, um, Jamie and Jessica and Erin for inviting me. I really appreciate it. What happens next? <laughs> Sorry, I was trying to unmute myself. This is Jamie Bograd again. Uh, thank you so much for your presentation. We want to be sure that if there are any questions, um, please feel free to use the Q&A panel at the bottom of the screen um, so that uh, we or she can answer any questions that you have. Um, while you are thinking of those questions, we also uh, want to request that you take the survey after you leave. Um, it'll automatically open in your browser at the end of the webinar. Again, your feedback will help us tailor our future topics and webinars to help meet your professional development needs. Uh, you'll also notice that some of the questions are designed to give Dr. Mandelak a better understanding of holistic review at osteopathic medical school. So we please, we encourage you to fill that out as well. And this recording will be posted at acom.org. Uh, backslash monthly forum. You can also register for all of the upcoming webinars we have scheduled for each month at acom.org. Um, and here is a preview um, on March 10th. Um, we are going to give you our update from ACOM that we typically give at the meeting, uh, at Educating Leaders meeting. We've done that um, as Cameo Leadership had asked to spend more time with you guys focusing on the business of the meeting. Um, in April, we have Tony Wynn, the new executive director of NAHP, presenting on his vis vision for the health professions and advising. And in May, we have Dr. Lisa Meeks from the University of Mich Michigan Medical School, and she'll be presenting on disabilities in medical education.
Um, so with that, uh, we want to continue to encourage you if you do have any questions um, to go ahead and ask them now. And I believe um, that, uh, and I'm sorry, and the slides um, we will share again uh, through our communities page. Um, Panel um, yet, um, but we'll take a few more minutes uh, till about three o'clock to stay on to um, answer any of those questions that you may have. Again, thank you so much for joining us. We really appreciate uh, you, Dr. Mandelak, taking uh, some time away from your busy schedule to help us uh, learn. Well, thanks for having me. I um, have so appreciated the collaboration between ACOM and CAPSID. Um, which is our you know, academic programs organization. And um, I just, I believe deeply in the power of collaboration. And I think that we all can really work together to, to change things. So I've learned a lot from y'all too. So we do have some questions starting to come in. It seems like people are a little bit nervous at first, but and someone wants to know um, how many applicants on average do you at your specific program get each year? Mm -hmm. So we, um, the average um, across the nation is a little bit over 200. Um, just as a range, Portland State, which is, you know, we're just outside of Portland and Portland State's uh, urban um, in the middle of the city. They've gotten anywhere for like 600 to 800 applications, um, but we've, 337 was the most we've ever gotten. And then we've also, this year we had around 190. And then how many do you end up matriculating into your class and then we matriculate 35. Okay. So um, we have gone as you know just down to like when we after we rank everybody down to number 55 to create that class of 35 and then sometimes we've gone down into the 90s to get that 35 but being the only program in the state that does interviews that certainly I think that just changes a little bit that dynamic of um, students getting to know our program. And I think that really helps. So. Perfect. It looks like we have someone with another question, um, although she's raising her hand. And so I'm allowing her to talk. <laughs> uh, Jackie, do you have a specific question that you wanted to ask as well? Okay, I'm having uh, technical difficulties. Let's see. Oh. Okay. Jamie, Jackie um, submitted her question in the Q&A box. Um, her question was, based on your results, do you have consistency in questions and evaluations from faculty? Jackie, maybe you could rephrase your question unless um, you... Consistency in questions, I'm not totally sure what that means um jackie could you could you um could you give me more info oh yes we have a set of questions to guide the interviews um and we do not use MMI as an interview method, um, despite the evidence that that's really, um, had, you know, that method has the most evidence. Um, but what we, we have six questions that are standard asked to all applicants. We have a standard preamble that we say at the beginning of every interview. So we try to keep it as structured as possible, but um, our questions, um, we just changed them so they're not as front of mind, but we used to ask about like receiving critical feedback, um, thinking, you know, a, a question that essentially got to strengths and weaknesses. So to look at realis realistic self-appraisal, um, thinking about, you know, how your background has led you to SLP, like what have you learned from it, to think about positive self-concept and strong support systems. So each one of our questions, each one of our six questions, maps back to certain non-cognitive variables, and then they're asked in the same order. Um, the students, it's, so it's standardized in that way, but of course, you know, if someone speaks longer about one, they may have less time to answer another. So that's the thing that can be a little non-standardized, but overall, that's um, standard questions. 
And then we use that rubric for our scoring. Yes, great. Well, I don't want to take up any more of your time um, or our attendees uh, time, but we really appreciate you taking the, the afternoon with us and um, we look forward to seeing some of those published papers soon. Oh, thank you. And thank you, Jamie, Jessica, and Erin. I really appreciate being invited and um, looking forward to more conversations. <laughs>